Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Grant, Vice President of Admissions and Business Development at Karen Treatment Centers. Welcome to the second installment of Karen's Signature Program Virtual Open House Series with today's session focusing on older adults. Uh, before we begin, we have a few quick housekeeping items. Um, we're conducting this session in webinar format, which means you can see here see and hear us, but we can't see and hear you. We'd love for you to interact with us though, so please feel free to send your questions or comments through the Q&A feature on your screen, and time has been allotted at the end of today's session to answer questions that come in. Uh, for clinical professionals in today's audience, uh, we are not awarding CEUs for today's presentation. And lastly, we are recording this session, so a link will be sent to you afterwards for you to watch later or share with any colleagues, patients, or families. Karen's signature programs address the unique clinical, medical, and psychological needs of certain populations that require specialized concierge level of care for substance use disorders and mental health conditions. At the core of these programs is our highly credentialed team who provides evidence-based, fully customized care that elevates patients and their families to achieve the best possible outcomes in recovery. Signature programs also feature deluxe accommodations as well as ancillary services that contribute to a safe and comfortable treatment experience. Karen's Older Adult Program is a highly specialized signature program designed to meet the needs of our older adult patients, uh, taking careful considerations of the common co-occurring conditions we see with this population while preserving their dignity, building their self-esteem, and developing healthier coping mechanisms. Today, we'll meet some of the expert staff who have worked with our older adult patients for years. Uh, but first, we want to take you inside the unit virtually to get a firsthand look at our facilities and philosophy behind this innovative program. My name is Dr. Wang. I'm the medical director of the Older Adult Program at Karen Treatment Centers. Our medical department at Karen Treatment Centers consists of multiple addiction medicine board of physicians, including two nurse practitioners, two addiction medicine fellows, attending physicians who are not only board certified in addiction medicine, but as well as other specialties such as surgery, anesthesia, and psychiatry. The nursing services provided on the older adult program are dedicated to this population only and separate from the remainder of uh, the campus and understands their needs and not only from a physiologic and medical standpoint but also from their cognitive uh, and emotional standpoint. Withdrawal management from various substances for older adults uh, are rather different uh, than uh, younger people because of there are specific uh, physiologic differences. Older adult uh, tends to come with more comorbid medical conditions that complicates the withdrawal management process. The older adult program at Karen Treatment Centers, we are capable of the care of severely compromised older adult patients, not only from a medical standpoint, but also from a cognitive uh, and physical standpoint. Many of our older adults come in severely compromised uh, the secondary perhaps to their substance use, but also of their underlying medical issues. Due to the deconditioned state and the frailty of many of our older adult patients that come to treatment, we are uh, fully mindful uh, of their ability for daily ADLs and uh, self-care. We provide all of our older adult patients at the time of their admission, one-to-one -one personal care aid to assist in any ADL needs and also to reduce risk of a fall. My name is Sharon Matthew, Clinical Director of the Older Adult Program at Karen Treatment Centers. What we found years ago is that there were more older adults coming into treatment and we gathered a group of them together, 65 on up, and immediately they liked the commonalities. They had had careers, they had raised their families, they sometimes had grandchildren. So that social aspect of the program was really important. They felt more comfortable, they felt more trusting. Treatment for this group is different from others in that it's a slower pace. People come in quite compromised, sometimes physically, so they might be on a wheelchair, a walker, cognitively impaired, they might have some memory issues as a direct result of their use. So we start slowly, we meet them where they are, and 
It is also a treatment that we developed out of dignity and respect because that's what this population requires and demands actually. This is also why we need a six week length of stay because it does take longer for them to sometimes join in and rebound. The testing process for the psychologist is really important. What she will do is a battery of tests to see how they are functioning, what their memory is like, what the cognitive abilities are. Routinely, the initial screenings are repeated about three weeks in after they have gotten more clear, after they are through their withdrawal process. The features of NEAG are so conducive to our program. All of the treatment is delivered here. I call it one-stop shopping. The doctors are on the first floor. We are on the second floor, elevator access to all floors. The lower level is where we do our groups and uh, physical therapy is on the first floor. Uh, massage is actually on the second floor. In the NEAC Center, we have our own dining room as well, which is extremely beautiful and has numerous selections for all three meals. The rooms are all ADA compliant. Everyone has a call button in either the suite that they're living in or in their bathroom. Uh, the hallways are very wide for that reason because we oftentimes do have several people in wheelchairs or walkers. The rooms are all suites, so there are 14 single rooms and then we have one room that's a double in case we do get a couple. We do treat couples, which is awesome. The bathrooms are all European bathrooms so that they can actually, if they're in a wheelchair, they can roll right into the shower. Everything is ADA compliant. There are numerous co-occurring issues with this uh, population. Oftentimes it's anxiety, depression, chronic pain, trauma. And what we're finding is this population is one that has not talked about some of their issues for many, many years. One of the large components of treatment that we do is grief and loss. This population is one who has suffered not only the loss of a loved one, but also loss of possibly mobility, loss of time, uh, loss of their careers if they're retired. Chronic pain is a major focus of this older adult population as well. So what we're trying to do is non-addictive pain medication treatment for this population. Physical fitness is really important to this population. The patients are able to go to the beautiful gymnasium, which is actually right next door. We have a serenity walk that we take them on as a therapeutic method as well. Movement is the best thing that they can do. But then we also have a nutritionist who meets with every older adult actually when they first come in to see what their nutritional needs are. Do they have a special diet they adhere to? We now have a family therapist on older adult, which is great. Uh, that person will work, be working with the families about the work they need to do for themselves. We have a signature family program, family education piece. And then we follow up with a family session via WebEx with those family members who attended and the patient. Family calls are uh, done once a week by the therapist, but then also with the family therapist, he also calls them as well to help walk them through any of their anxieties, their fear, again, redirecting them to focus on what they can do for themselves. Some of the other treatment modalities we use for older adults is dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Additionally, we can also offer EMDR. There are certain therapists on campus who are trained in that modality. Our motto on older adults is life worth living, purpose and quality of life. We are here to give that back to them. What is going to have you get up in the morning? What's going to get you up and moving now that you are sober and in this stage of life, you know, what is next for you? Now, I'm pleased to introduce two of the key members of our older adult team uh, that I've had the honor and privilege of working with for many years now. First, we have Sharon Matthew, uh, who you just saw in the video. Sharon is the clinical director of the older adult program, and she has been an integral piece of designing this and providing clinical oversight of this particular program since 2015. And then we also have Dr. Ming Wang, who is a full-time physician at Karen, and he provides medical oversight to the older adult program. Thank you both for being here with us today. And we will start with Sharon, who will reiterate and add to the general overview of the program provided in the video that you just saw. Welcome, Sharon. Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you to you and your team for putting this all together because it's really important to get our message out to people that may be not aware of the type of treatment we do. And for our population, they are absolutely more physically, medically, and cognitively compromised. And then there's also what we talked about earlier, the co-occurring conditions. And some of it's a direct result of aging process, but then it's also a part of the drugs and alcohol they might have been using. They do better in an environment with a slower pace. It is a safe setting, as I described on the video, all ADA compliant. And we can we can absolutely meet them where they are. And we actually 
have them join us as they're able to do so. Medical has to come first, which I know the doctor will mention that again. Their families are so entrenched in caretaking. They are absolutely worn out by the time we get the patients. They've been most likely worried about their loved one for a very long time, but first of all, they don't know how to approach it, or they go back to thinking, oh, well, it's not so bad, or it's going to get better, none of which actually works. And some of the couples that we, not the couples we treat, but the family members aligned with the patient, some of them have been married for 45 or 50 years. So how do we intervene on that? And how does an adult child say to the person who was the person who raised them that they have a problem and how do we approach that? So we treat the spouses, the siblings, the adult children, as I said, oftentimes they are extremely angry, frustrated and scared, do not know what to do. And many times they're also all over the United States. So they're just getting reports on their loved one maybe falling or not doing well. And they are at a loss of as to what to do. So many of them use an interventionist to get their loved one into treatment. And I think one of the importances of this community setting is that they are finally now socializing with people who are in their same age set, same mindset. They might have raised families. They might have had their careers. They are sometimes now retired, all suffering either losses of that or loss of a person that was close to them. And the denial is so, I don't know what other to say than deep. Their barriers to getting to the point of admitting to alcoholism or substance use is really, really difficult. There's some shame attached to that. They can't even imagine that someone would call them an alcoholic or an addict. And we use the term, of course, substance use disorder. And so it takes time. It takes time for them to trust us with that. They do much more of opening up in individual sessions than off time in a group setting because that again is tied to them feeling some shame. We approach family of origin with them because some of the family messages for them were don't talk about it, keep it close to the vest. You don't put that out there and you just suck it up and sort of get busy with life. Um, it takes a certain type of clinician or a staff member. We have found we have had to be extremely creative with this group. They do like experiential therapy. They like to see how things work. They want to know the nuts and bolts and all of that. And so I have found that the staff, as Dr. Wang and I always say, have to be dedicated, not designated. They have to want to work with this population, having compassion, having some patience and tolerance, and also understanding the uniqueness of this population, which is absolutely there. Uh, when we see them socialize and starting to feel better, they actually feel better about themselves and then they seem to want more of that. Um, as we described in the video, the facility is so conducive and you saw the video all one floor. They're on the second floor, but then accessibility to the first floor to the docks and also to PT in the dining room. All our groups are on the lower level elevator access. The bathrooms European style because we will get off times people who are very compromised in wheelchairs and walkers. So everything is easy access for them. And the beauty of our setting is we have nursing here 24 seven. So we have a nursing station. They get the medications on this floor. The psychologist is here and all my clinicians, myself and the family therapist. So it has been nothing but wonderful moving to this building in 2017. And what we have I looked up the figures yesterday since 2015 when we opened, we have now treated 632 older adults, which is quite awesome. Wow, that's amazing, Sharon. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Ming Wang, who will elaborate a little more on the medical acuity that Karen's older adult program can handle as well as the detox process. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and I want to I want to thank all of our uh, virtual guests out there. Thanks for participating. Uh, our older adult population uh, often comes to us uh, sort of as a as a last resort for the family. Oftentimes, they come to us uh, secondarily from an acute setting, such as the hospital or nursing care facility, uh, because something happened something bad happened, whether it's a terrible fall, uh, whether it's a, a poor self-care at home and the family uh, family just became aware of this. And so when our older adults come to our facility, typically there are uh, in a very uh, 
a deconditioned state and in a bad medical uh, condition. And it offers a certain challenge to us because not only do we need to safely manage the withdrawal uh, from their substance of choice, whether that's alcohol or prescription medications, uh, but we also have to manage their uh, underlying comorbid medical conditions, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, and things like that. And uh, the older adults, not just older adults, but across the board in all populations, when someone's in the throes of their addiction, oftentimes they don't take care of themselves. and They're, they're not non-compliant with their medications that they're prescribed. So they're in the worst way possible coming to us. So the foremost task that we have is to ensure safety. Medical safety always comes first here at Care and Treatment Centers. And we have a medical center here and the capacity, uh, medical capacity and nursing capacity to care for this population. Uh, and I'll have to add also that in the older adult population in the United States, the number one substance of use is still alcohol. And follow closely behind that, number two and number three are prescription opioids and benzodiazepines. Now, in this population, our experience is that they typically take their medications as prescribed by their doctors, whether they're opioids, benzodiazepines, other sort of sedatives, but they do take it by prescription. However, because their, their age and the, the duration that they've been exposed to these medications, it becomes a daunting task to get them off of these medications. And in this population, not only because of their age and the physiologic changes that occurs uh, as we age naturally, that, all, that present as a challenge to uh, safe withdrawal management from not just alcohol, but prescription medications. Uh, but also, uh, also the comorbid medical conditions that compounds the complexity of this population. As we become older, our body changes, not just the tissues, the organs, but also uh, the central nervous system, which is very important when it comes to withdrawal management. Our central nervous system becomes more vulnerable to any medications or substances that we use so that not even with alcohol, the same amount of alcohol that the person might have consumed a few decades ago as a younger person becomes more significant at an, at an older age. Medication is the same way. They perhaps were prescribed a, a controlled substance, a mood altering agent many, many years ago when they were younger. Uh, and at this age, those same exact medications becomes more significant regarding how it impacts the body and especially the central nervous system. So all these things have to be taken into account and how to go about getting them off of these medications, manage the withdrawal symptoms in a, in a very safe and as comfortably as possible. And then the co other co-occurring medical issues, um, uh, Sharon had mentioned a little while ago, uh, there are underlying conditions that require uh, monitoring, but that requires continued management, and as well as their chronic pain issues. Oftentimes, chronic pain is very significant in this population, not only due to age and conditions that comes along with the typical aging process, such as arthritis, osteoarthritis, joint pain, and things like that. Uh, this, this has to be addressed while they're with us because these issues may be just the reasons why they drink alcohol or use uh, or use the prescription medications that they've been prescribed. So we do have the capacity to address common medical issues here, as well as managing chronic pain so that we could uh, offer a sustainable solution to their problems. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Wang. Sharon, would you please give us a deeper look at the typical patient that we treat on the older adult unit, as well as the different treatment modalities that we utilize and how we work with family systems? Sure. Overall, we treat people 55 to 90, and we have had two 90-year-olds who treat people in their 80s. 
Typically, 60s to 70s are most of the common age bracket. Although with this unit being what it is, we have taken people who are younger than that if they needed the medical attention. And it is truly interdisciplinary, starting with uh, when they come in the nursing assessment and then the history and physical by the docs and then the psychological assessment. Our doctor is well versed on testings and initial screening. So we do the Montreal cognitive screen at first to just get a baseline of what their cognition is like. Uh, normal score is 30 under 26. You're starting to be impaired. We've actually treated people who have score 2 or 10 or 18. If they have that kind of impairment, then you just don't know, is it going to bounce back? Is this a start of dementia? But of course, early on, that's way too early to assess that too much or know what it's going to look like later on. So we do reassess that uh, scoring. And then the doctor is also able to do neuropsych testing to get a better, clearer picture. Some of that is dementia screening. Some of that is uh, ADLs. How are they going to function back home? And so that gives the family then an idea of what they're facing. After that, then the clinician does their psychosocial, and from that, then the treatment plan is formulated. And yes, we do give them assignments. We start everybody if they're good to go with the reading of under the influence because alcoholics just don't get the background story of it or understand the scientific piece. And they really tend to, as I said, this population likes to understand. They want to know what's really going on. So you can give them those types of things. The first step prep that is very good sort of breaks up through some denial as well. So our goal is to assess, to educate, to get them up and moving. It does take longer with this population, as I mentioned before, and then get them engaged in the group process and then go into the specialty groups. CBT is one of our uh, go-tos. The doctor will do that either individually or in a group. The DBT I talked about, the dialectical behavioral. We also have trauma programming. Older adults are resistant sometimes to looking at that, but actually need to because this is a population who might have had trauma 60 years ago or 50 years ago and then just shoved it under a rug and didn't want to look at it, but they need to. Uh, and you're never too old to do that type of work. We have a clinician who does CPT, cognitive processing therapy, with those patients who have suffered from PTSD, which really helps them tremendously. And again, our goal here is to get them to find purpose and quality of life. So Dr. Wang mentioned the, the chronic pain condition. So anxiety, depression are the co-occurring, sometimes process addictions, whether it be sex relationships, eating, shopping, spending, work. Actually, we do have patients who are still working and then got tied into the work and money piece. So we do addiction interaction treatment here with the older adults, whether it be individually or in a group setting. Uh, and then other than that, 12-step uh, recovery is every day. We do 12-step at night, but it's very varied. It's either AA, NA, Dharma recovery. Uh, it could be smart recovery. And then we also do chronic pain anonymous. So I'm a part of the chronic pain programming. We give them uh, ancillary such as acupuncture, massage, uh, PT if warranted, physical therapy, and then a wellness consult person who will come and meet with them actually weekly or see them in the gym to get them moving. And as we talked about early, Kelly, uh, motion is lotion for a chronic pain person. Movement is absolutely needed for that. As far as the family goes, we. Uh, it is so deep, and I don't know how else to say that, then there's many patients, uh, family members attached to one patient. So you are working with the spouse, the sibling, the adult children, weekly giving them a call. So our family therapist is Dan Westerman now, and he gives them a call weekly to have them again focus on what can you be doing for yourself? We are here taking care of your loved one. And then the clinician will call the families once a week for an update on the patient. And then they are now nicely coming together, which we always have done uh, with family sessions. That's a minimum of twice a month. Oftentimes it's more than that because of all the people that are attached to the case. And then having a plan for everybody uh, so that when they go back home, if that's in fact where they're headed, that they understand their own enabling behaviors, can set boundaries here and then stick to the boundaries. But as far as the next steps go, it's so varied with this population. Some do go to outpatient. COVID really threw a wrench into that because it all went virtual. A lot of patients relapsed during COVID if they had gotten treatment before. And getting them engaged in that Zoom process is sometimes a little difficult, but we do teach them that here. 
getting them involved in the alumni Zoom meeting that we do uh, once a month is helpful as well. We offer them My First Year, which is a year-long monitoring program, very good for the patient. They have a clinician attached to them, and then the family member has a person attached to them, so they can talk about what's going on for them. Uh, Soberlink's involved in that. It helps them guide through early recovery because those are the that's the tough thing. The first year is really a difficult piece for them. But then it also means, do they go home? Are they good enough to go home? Or are they as actually headed for assisted living? We have absolutely had the cases where the family had to work on assisted living while they were with us because they were not equipped to go home, either based on their compromised state or what their layout of their house was. Some with the memory issues, some had to go on to memory care. That's happened, happened several times, especially in the last year. Uh, Dr. Daltrick has a blog out there about how cognitive issues have uh, been more of a problem and bigger issue during COVID. We're seeing a lot more people scoring low on those assessments. Their use is more, they're more compromised, not only that way, but also physically. So very individualized continuing care and very labor intensive, I might say. Thanks so much for that, Sharon. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the admission process as well as uh, the specialized case management that Karen provides specifically for this program. Uh, both Sharon and Dr. Wang, I will always sing their praises for many reasons, but one of the most incredible things that they do is they're very involved from that first phone call into admissions. Uh, for reasons that you can all probably imagine, we wanna make sure that we are absolutely certain that Karen's Older Adult Program is the best fit for someone. Uh, the majority of Karen's patients aren't necessarily from Pennsylvania, they're from all over the country. So when we talk about this particular group of people getting on a plane or traveling a long distance in a car, when they have not only the substance use disorder, but other comorbidities um, you know, going on medically and psychologically, we just always want to make sure that we are, in fact, the best program for them. So Sharon and Dr. Wang are amazing, and they work with our admissions team from that first call, whether it's speaking with the patient, speaking with the family, um, getting medical records, reviewing those, working with the, the patient's physician at home, uh, working with the hospital system that they're currently in, um, and our case management team. Uh, is tracking that throughout the entire time and just making sure that all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. We're also working with the family to make sure their needs are getting met while their loved one is in treatment, whatever that looks like, as Sharon has touched on earlier. We absolutely believe in treating the entire family system while the, the IP, while the loved one is getting the treatment with us. We wanna make sure that the family is also getting what they need. And we also wanna play an integral role in setting up what that continuing care planning is going to look like when they go home, as Sharon touched on. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk about what we do as it relates to an admission standpoint and how involved Sharon and Dr. Wang are with that, as well as our amazing case management team and how we do our best to make sure we are getting people to the best place, you know, whether that's within Karen's continuum or not. So just appreciate everything y'all do to help us with that and wanted to let the folks know that are viewing this, that if you have specific questions, concerns about uh, a patient, a client, a family member of your own, please know that we're here for you and happy to talk through those individual cases to see if Karen can in fact be helpful. Um, and next we wanted to move into the Q&A feature. Um, a lot of you have submitted questions ahead of time, so we will go through those. You can also still use the Q&A feature in the bottom right hand portion of your screen to submit a question. And just know that if we don't have enough time to get through everything today, we will certainly follow up with you to make sure that your questions are answered. Um, some of these questions, Sharon and Dr. Wang, y'all have touched on, but uh, folks might want us to elaborate a little bit more. Um, the first question that came in is, how do we integrate a 12-step program into the care of our older adult patients? And Sharon, I know you were talking about them attending meetings, whether it be, you know, AA or NA or Dharma. In, in your experience working with this population, do you find that they are resistant in a different way from maybe our younger patients as it relates to um, the, the stigma of the label of feeling like they need to identify as an alcoholic? or as an addict? And what are ways that we help them process through that? And what are ways that we make sure they have that peer support that 12-step that programs do, do provide that we all know is so incredibly valuable to someone's ongoing recovery? Uh, but can you touch on that a little more? 
Surely there is absolute resistance. Now, some people will flat out say, I don't like that God stuff, and then that keeps them out of the meetings. Uh, others will find a lot of shame attached to it, but I can't let anybody know in my neighborhood that I got to go to a meeting. Then uh, what we do is sort of sneakily come in there. We talk about higher power. We talk about this is not religion. This is not what we're you know, preaching and teaching. We ease into it. If someone says, I'm not going to do that 12-step meeting tonight, we let them have that for a little bit. Then we try to encourage them to come and listen to, especially they like this. If there's a good speaker, which we do by Zoom now, they really gravitate towards that. They hear the message and it's it's much better for them and, and understanding what it's like in the meeting. We also, before COVID, had alumni speakers come back here. They really like that. They want to hear from people who are of their age and how it worked for them. So that's why the thing that Keith Rogers set up in our alumni department, we have a 12-step, it's not 12-step, it's alumni fellowship Zoom meeting Thursday afternoon, third Thursday of the month, 2.30 to 3.30, and it's alumni of the older adult program. They like that as well because that's someone who went through what they did. They can understand it better and there's sort of less of a stigma to that. So it's it's a tough thing at first. They do get over the hump, so to speak. Most go out of here with it at least saying we're going to try it. And we also, I told you, uh, we actually help download the Zoom meetings on their phones, get them to try it here. Since we haven't been able to have speakers, my staff will get a Zoom meeting going like on a Sunday afternoon and they'll have it from all over the country after we did one not too long ago from Ireland. So it gets them to understand that this is, you know, a common theme outside of here. We also give them a 12 step contact prior to leaving, have them introduce themselves on the phone. So it's someone that they can rely on maybe at first until they might get engaged in 12 step programming and a sponsor. And I, I also want to add to what Sharon just said. I think that's a very important question because we as an organization, care and treatment centers, we, we are based on Dick Karen's legacy of the 12 steps. And so that's very important to us. And yes, there are many, many people who come to our uh, facility, regardless of whether they're older adults or not, who are resistant to the 12 steps. And oftentimes that's due to misinformation or lack of experience. And uh, in addition to what uh, Sharon has said, uh, in our older adult program, we do we do uh, integrate them into other programs if they have the, have the capacity to do so, uh, whether physical or cognitive capacity uh, to uh, mingle, so to speak, with other units who are uh, engaged in 12-step work. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a, a older adult male who just uh, went home this morning. Uh, before he came in, we already knew that he was very resistant to 12 steps. He went to a few AA meetings and immediately declared that this is not for me. While he's here, not only did he receive the medical care that he desperately needed, he's got great therapy uh, from Sharon's team. And we were, when he became more conditioned, and stronger, we had them participate in 12-step meeting, AA meetings with um, uh, other men's population on our campus, and he absolutely loved it. And so he's determined to uh, go to AA uh, starting tomorrow, <laughs> and uh, he already secured an AA sponsor. So that's how the changes come, and we do provide that so that it can happen. And the women have started to join the women's now that we can open up a little bit with the COVID restrictions. Now our women can join the women's meeting at night in Chensi as well. Thank you so much, both of you, for elaborating on that. Uh, this next question is for you, Dr. Wang. I know me personally over the years, I've gotten a lot of calls um, from family members. Usually it's the children of older adults concerned about their mom or dad's typically drinking or prescription use, but also their memory. And how do you determine if the person is experiencing dementia versus an alcohol-induced memory deficit? Um, you know, we oftentimes see and hear a lot about sundowners, which, um, you know, coincidentally also happens about the same time as happy hour for a lot of folks. It does. Um, <laughs> so how do we at Karen, how do we help someone determine 
if the memory, if the cognitive issues are a result of possibly an actual dementia versus a substance use um, situation? Yeah, that, that's probably one of the most important questions that, that we are presented with. One of the uh, signs that family sees is uh, memory loss. Mom or dad, they can't seem to remember as well as before. They, they're very forgetful. They forgot about the conversation we just had last evening. And, and these presentations are not unusual at all. And uh, oftentimes raise grave concerns for uh, family members with any memory impairment, confusion, cognitive impairment. We could not absolutely declare whether that's a, a baseline underlying dementia or substance induced. When someone is actively using a mood altering substance, there is no ability to differentiate those until they are far removed from their substance of choice. And uh, uh, however, to go about uh, clarifying this picture, the first thing that must happen from a medical standpoint is that we have to be sure that with absolute certainty that it's not an organic cause, which means that it's not due to head trauma, bleeding in the head, or tumor, for example. And once that uh, the organic cause is ruled out, then the next thing that we must explore would be uh, mood altering agents, alcohol, control substances, or other medications, common medications prescribed by physicians for treatment of underlying conditions. Uh, sometimes even psychiatric medications could cause confusion, memory loss, and delirium. So what we're talking about is differentiating the types of confusion, uh, whether that's just memory loss and what kind of memory loss is it? Is it short-term memory loss? Is it long-term memory loss? Memory loss induced by substances are typically, uh, typically affects the frontal lateral lobe of our brain, and that accounts for short-term memory loss and that processing speed, not able to process information that's presented to them, not to, able to process their uh, stimuli. And if someone has a long-term memory loss, for example, they cannot re remember their children's names, uh, uh, bringing up their children, their past work history, uh, that becomes more concerning uh, because it affects the different areas of the brain. And so once people are here, we safely uh, manage their withdrawal. They're free and clear from uh, uh, their substance withdrawal and, and far removed from their last use. Then the picture may become more clear. We have a uh, uh, wonderful psychologist here, Dr. Daughter, who initially will do a quick cognitive screen. And uh, our experience here is that most of our older adults come here with certain degree of cognitive impairment based on a quick screen called MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And uh, along the way, Dr. Dodger will retest them as they're further out from their last use and then um, with a final test at the very end of their treatment. And what we typically see is the improvement of their cognition. Now, we do see people uh, who do not get better. Their cognitive impairment stays the same throughout treatment, and then we would have uh, we would have to help the family plan the appropriate next level of care. Help the family navigate after discharge uh, wraparound care. Sometimes our older adults are so impaired that they cannot live independently. That they have no capacity of taking care of themselves take their own medications appropriately, then the whole our team uh, will assist the family in placing in a more appropriate next level of care, whether that's a nursing care facility, assisted living, or have an in-home live-in uh, care. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Wang. I think you really hit on um, one of the many reasons why when we get 
calls from family members saying, I don't know if it's, you know, if it's bad enough, should I do anything yet? Is this just sort of normal rite of passage at this age when you're retired? And I think to your point, it's, you know, oftentimes by the time they do get to us, uh, the damage may be irreversible. Um, so the sooner that, that we can help them or get them into an appropriate program, the better their chances are for that, uh, that damage not to be permanent. So thank Please you for collaborating on that. Go ahead, Sharon. We work with people that maybe called us months ago and should have come in at that point. And then by the time we get them three months later, they're so more impaired than they were when we initially spoke to them. So we can't stress enough with the families that strike. You've got to strike while they aren't hot. Whatever it's got to take, whatever you, leverage you have, please use it. The family is the leverage for this population. They want to see their grandchildren. They want to be involved. And that's usually what gets them to the chairs. And then, as I said, usually later on. But the impairment is so varied. Sometimes it's it's not going to change. Sometimes it creeps back up. Sometimes people's scores go down as a direct result of depression or anxiety that they're going through. It's really an interesting thing. And uh, so each one has to be looked at so individually. And then her capability, Dr. Daughtrix, of doing the extra neuropsych testing is awesome. And the reports are phenomenal. It gets them to understand, and also the families, if they're allowing us to tell the family what the impairment really is and what does this mean to the next function? Where am I going? Can they really go home? Like he said, some go right to memory care, some go right to assisted living as a result of that. Absolutely. And that's actually, Sharon, your timing is perfect as always, because that's a great segue into another question that's come in uh, that would love to hear from both of you on in that what advice do you have, whether it be for family members or for clinicians, when they have a loved one or a patient or a client that they feel can benefit from this, they just don't know where to start as it relates to having that conversation with them. What, what advice, suggestions, specific points what advice do you give to these families or to these clinicians to help the older adult population see that they may need to, uh, to look at their relationship with alcohol and drugs to determine is it still working for them and uh, is there maybe a better route that they should be taking? As I said, not burying your head in the sand and thinking it's going to get better. I think talking about it to someone, whether it be your own physician or if you have a therapist or many people come to us by Googling addiction treatment for older adults, and there we are. And they will initially make the calls and give us a like, what if, you know, what about this, what about that? I think talking to a professional, easing their fears, uh, and, and them too having stigma around, oh my God, you're really saying my mom or dad is an alcoholic. Uh, having them talk about it is essential and reaching out for help. And the sooner the better. What we see is there, I, I do know it's the admissions process, Getting an older adult into treatment is labor intensive and takes seems to take longer because you have to talk to the families, then you talk to the patient, then you talk to all of them on the phone. Prior to COVID, we would have people actually come here, the families would come here and look at our facility, say, is this the right setting for my loved one? They've flown maybe to another state to look at another treatment facility. So they have to do the research asking for help. Interventionists are out there and there's so many that are so good. Deborah J, we, we have some of her people come here. She has a very loving, caring way uh, and her facility does of getting someone to talk to their loved ones about why they really need treatment. So I think just putting it out there, asking, asking the right people for help, but not postponing it because time is of the essence with this population. It really is. No. Adding to what Sharon just said, for clinicians out there who need to talk to their older adult patients or the family members in how to get them into treatment, I would say that the greatest motivator, one of the greatest motivator to present to the older adult patient and the family is to remind them that the, 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 one of the, the greatest goal of treatment is to improve their function and quality of life so that they can go out and do the things that they enjoy, including visiting their children, visiting their grandchildren, where when they were drinking or using their prescription medications, they are non-functional and sedentary. And, uh, uh, and, and all, this also applies to older adults with chronic pain conditions. The pain condition is so awful uh, and so debilitating and now you have these uh, prescription pain medications that just just compounds the situation. They have no function, no quality of life, 
They're not visiting with their children, their grandchildren who they love. So that's one of the greatest motivators that we will work to get their function and quality of life back. And we could, Sharon and I could give you all examples after examples, virtually all patients who come here walk out of our doors with yep. better function and quality Absolutely. of life. And Dr. Wang, on that note, another question that came in was um, specific to co-occurring medical conditions. And you just sort of touched on that with what you were saying with chronic pain. What are some of the things we see oftentimes where the medical condition is exacerbated by the substance use disorder, whether that be like the opioid-induced hyperalgesia, uh, sleep disorders, um, obviously mobility issues, um, some of the other medical concerns that we see that are being exacerbated by the, uh, the alcohol or the, the prescription drugs or whatever it is that they're abusing and how many times those things clear up rather rapidly once they take this step. Virtually all mood altering substances will exacerbate underlying medical conditions. Alcohol, prescription, opioids, and benzodiazepines. Uh, th this is, uh, the medical community have known about this for a long, long time. Uh, some physicians are more savvy than others, obviously. And it all goes back to the physiologic condition developed by these mood-altering substances, not just alcohol. Uh, if we talk about just alcohol itself, alcohol, uh, if we consider the alcohol molecule as a toxin to every single cell we have in our body, it changes everything. It changes how our, our uh, body develops, our cells develop. It, uh, affects, uh, it affects how it normally is supposed to function, and it affects how normal prescription medications work in our body. So if someone's drinking excessive amount of alcohol, whatever medications they are taking, we could consider that effect to be nullified. So if they're on medications for their high blood pressure, for their heart disease, if they're drinking on a daily basis in, in excess uh, excessive amounts, uh, they are really not controlling their underlying medical issues. Therefore, the underlying medical issues continue to progress and worsen over time. Therefore, complications just from that. And, and so it is important to keep all of these things uh, in mind when we uh, when we face a new order of adults. We have to know all their underlying medical conditions, their current state right now. Not a month ago, not a year ago, but how is it right now? So that we could have a plan of action moving forward once they arrive to address those issues. It's about body, mind, and soul. And I always use the phrase, the, the level of sickness is equal to the level of denial. So most recently we've seen, we had three cirrhosis patients here on the unit at one time. It's, it's just sad, it, might, it saddens my heart. And then if they have the other issues, Many people come here after a hospital stay because they fall, hit their heads, and they might have a traumatic brain injury. So again, time is of the essence. We need time for them to clear, time for the doctor to do his work with the other um, conditions. A lot of uh, heart conditions with this population, uh, then the combination of heart and maybe diabetes. So it's, it's a complicated kind of thing that we can sift through and then once they get better, I've seen the doctors sort of demedicalize it where they need less, uh, and the action meds then they're on are working. So, but that's why we have a minimum of six weeks length of stay. Sometimes people stay two months, three, four, or actually five months. So, time is what's needed. And can both of you elaborate a little more on the benefits of this particular population being in a standalone program? Um, compared to what treatment looks like for younger patients and why someone in the older adult program, why they do better than when they're in treatment with folks, maybe, you know, say 20s, 30s, 40s. What have you found that are the major differences that this particular population benefits from the most in having their own standalone program? One of the biggest things for me is, as I said before, they demand respect they will not tolerate a group where someone's cursing, carrying on, uh, listening to talk about using sort of maybe street drugs, that kind of thing. 
Here it is the commonalities. It's the fact that and many creeped in, many functioned, 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 and then retired, and then the drinking took off. Many got on prescription medications as a direct result of a chronic pain condition. Before that, had not used. We treated an 80-year-old who had had double knee replacement, was placed on opiates, and she, before that, had used nothing. So then she got physically, psychologically hooked. So I think it's that understanding of where they all came from, sharing their lives. This is a population that does really, really well when you get them to tell their stories. When they tell their stories of how they evolved and their life, most degrees, their families, it's really a joy to watch that they have an equal respect for one another and understanding and then can give each other sort of encouragement as well. So I've treated a lot, we treat a lot of people who have been in other settings where there was a mixed population. And that's how it used to be here at Karen as well, where you were with 19 year olds, 24, whatever. And they claim this is far better for them. Uh, they like it, it's not chaotic usually. And uh, that to me stands out. Yeah, the, the older adults, uh, they do not do well in a very, very rigid environment. Uh, perhaps because of their age, the generation they grew up, they certainly demand and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And not only that, because of their uh, uh, physical condition and cognitive condition, they demand close attention. Yes. And uh, the remainder of our uh, uh, facility outside of the old adult program, that population, they do not demand that level of attention, uh, the medical and nursing acuity. And this population does, and we offer that level of acuity on our older adult program. Now, there is a limit because we are not a hospital. Uh, people who are in, in a very uh, uh, severe medical condition that requires a higher level of care, we will transfer them to our uh, sister facility down the road, uh, Tower Health Hospital, for that level of care, and then they will come back. But we are capable of managing uh, uh, most complex cases here. And I think it's because of the setting we have with mentioning the doc sees them every day and then the nurses being here 24 seven. That is the reason why we can take the ones that are so complicated. And Sharon, you and your team, I've always been so impressed that y'all do such a great job, especially with this population of connecting them back to having a sense of purpose where they may feel like they have lost that, um, whether it be through loss of identity, through no longer working, or um, relationships that are strained with their family members. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you and your team do such an amazing job of, of really connecting this population back to having a sense of purpose and a quality of life that uh, that is immeasurable? Surely. Uh one of the things I do is a, at least a once a month life worth living lecture, but it takes a little while to get up to that point. They have to be sort of with it. The cognition has to improve and that kind of thing for them to comprehend it. But it's about looking at what do you need, what do you want, and what's going to get you up in the morning, as I mentioned earlier. When they first come in, they have no idea how this is going to improve. But when they see that, and the beauty of this unit too, they will come in and see someone who is farther along the road, and then they see that those people are pretty well doing good, and they reconnect with their families. This population overall, always, always, they want to be with their families. They want to um, get back into life. I had this guy from the South actually who said, I want to find wonder again. He had come through the loss of his wife. And he just had no idea how am I going to get back to any chronic pain. I used to golf. I can't do that anymore. And then what he did is bring an old putting green in his room. And then he was starting to putt while he was here. This is the kind of stuff we do. So, but then with the connection with the families and them sort of cheerleading and us cheerleading, we get them to identify with us. What can you now do? Maybe you can't do this. Maybe you still have some chronic pain. But what can you do? So I have to look at, yeah, you might have had some losses. I always say reflect in the rear view mirror. The rear view mirror is small but for a reason. You reflect on it, but your whole thing is the bigger windshield where you're supposed to be looking forward. Never too late to develop this better quality of life. Never, never. I don't care if you're 90, 95, you name it. And when we see them smiling, getting along, going to the gym, getting that home again to get up in the morning, 
they absolutely do want more of it. So that's the focus for us. Thank you for actually sharing that story. I love the how do I find wonder again? That's uh, it's very heartwarming. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we are running close on time. So um, uh, we will do one or maybe two more questions, Sharon. But if you can quickly answer, um, you touched on briefly how we do treat couples on the older adult unit. Can you talk quickly about, you know, what that looks like in the sense of we obviously want to make sure that both individuals are able to do their own work simultaneously. Uh, can you touch on that quickly? Sure. Like we've treated couples now over the last four years quite successfully, I would say. Some were on the same unit, some were on separate units, but recently it's been on the same unit, so we have that double room for that reason. When a couple is, are both alcoholic or, or addicted, maybe to a chemical, the best thing someone can do, a family can get them into treatment together. And oftentimes one won't come without the other. That's the other piece. One might say, well, mine's not as bad as hers or, or his, but you know they didn't want to come along, so I'm coming with them. And both meet the criteria for substance use disorder, usually moderate or severe. So they come in together, they assign two different clinicians who keep them very separate that way. We don't talk about the one in the one session. We don't talk about the other one. We make them stick to themselves, which is tough for them because they're pretty enmeshed. They've been married probably 50 years. That's what we've seen, especially recently. And then getting to do individual work with them, then we have a lot of family work. So you do a family session with the loved ones with the one adult, and then you do another family session with the other. Then you bring them all in the same room. So that's two clinicians, usually myself and now the family therapist, and the two patients. Getting them to focus on not answering for the other one is really interesting. Educating them separately, getting them to understand what we call it is, is chemical coping is what they've been doing. So getting them to find coping skills and getting them to put the blinders on at times. That's what we're working with. We have a couple right now and that's what we're working on, getting the person to focus on that, that one person and not the significant other. Uh, it's very interesting. It's so worthwhile. I love, usually the outcome of is quite good because as I said, if one's gonna get treatment, the other one has to do it at the same time or they'll drag each other down. Then getting the best option the hard sell is if one is more compromised than the other and they won't separate. So how does one get to this assisted living over here and then this one really doesn't think it's necessary yet. So that continuing care is also very interesting, very complicated at times. What we do know that works for this population is a recovery coach. So the recovery coach could help the couple at the same time. You could have one coach then as they go home for the both of them. So takes time and usually they need two months instead of six weeks. Thank you, Sharon. And um, I do want to be mindful of time. We did just have a question come in about trauma that we won't have time to answer today, but I did want to let everyone know we do have an upcoming webinar that will be a CEU on June 16th that's specific to treating trauma and PTSD um, in the older adult population with one of the amazing therapists who works alongside of Sharon and Dr. Matthew, or Sharon and Dr. Wang. Sharon should be a doctor. We're going to start calling you Dr. Matthew. But um, thank you both to, uh, to Sharon and to Dr. Wang for joining us today. And thank you so much to all of, of our attendees who joined us today. Uh, before we conclude, I want to share some additional opportunities coming up at Karen in addition to that June 16th webinar that I just mentioned. We're hosting two more virtual open house um, series this summer, one for our Grandview Men's Program and also one for Karen Ocean Drive. So we'll have more details on that soon. Um, additionally, we have two great opportunities for professionals to receive CEUs tomorrow at 11 a.m. Our Karen Florida team is very proud to bring you a webinar entitled Applying the Polyvagal Theory in a Clinical Setting, Neuroception, and Co-Regulation in Trauma focused practice. It's quite the mouthful, but it'll be amazing. Um, and this is eligible for social work credit. Also next Wednesday on May 26 at 1030, we'll be hosting a webinar entitled Treating the Jewish Patient, Breaking the Stigma and Acknowledging Faith-Based Practices for Success and Recovery. Um, that will be incredible as well. Karen does a lot with the Jewish community and we're very proud of that work. Um, and that's going to be eligible for an APA credit. Um, for more information and to register, you can visit karen.org backslash webinars. And lastly, if you're interested in learning more specifically about the older adult population, um, Karen will be hosting that webinar on June 16th. So we'll have more information on that soon. 
Um, please reach out to your local regional resource directors regarding admissions to any of our programs, questions, concerns about services, resources, or events happening in your area. And thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to see y'all again soon. Take care. Thank you.